Uh, okay, everyone, uh, welcome back. I think we had an excellent discussion uh, this morning, so I hope we can carry on in that spirit uh, this afternoon. I'd like to thank our, our hosts, uh, particularly the Ministry of Finance Indonesia, for organizing uh, such a great event uh, here in Yogyakarta. Uh, with me, we have three distinguished speakers. We have Swath Stephen Nazara, who is the chair of the Indonesian Fiscal Policy Agency, which is an extremely important job in this country. We have Wendy Hal. Hal Ward Dreemeyer, Senior Advisor at the World Bank, and we have Professor Edward Buckingham of Monash University. Now, I think if you think about the subject, it's absolutely huge, I think, in terms of its implications and in terms of its complexity. And we got a really good feel this morning, I think, for just how big the challenges are. To my mind, there were really kind of two sets of issues that emerged uh, from this morning. One is that we're going to go through a period of massive structural change. Whether that's bigger than in the past, whether it's going to accelerate, uh, we don't really know. But it's clear that things are going to change a lot. The second thing is that digital, uh, digital and new technologies open up a new paradigm. Things that are different from the past, things that we haven't seen before. Things like the platform economy, things like the gig economy. Having firms that have huge, huge uh, scale without any real mass, co companies like Airbnb, and the list goes on. So we have a, we're facing a set of things that we know something about, these structural changes and this new paradigm at the same time. Uh, what I took from this morning was actually a relatively optimistic message, that in the past we have managed to preserve and, and create jobs even when there's been big structural change. But the pace of change is actually likely to be fairly slow because it's likely to be held back by the time it takes to adopt these new technologies rather than switching from uh, this economy to the new economy in one big leap. And also that we've lived through this before. And, and though on the whole, you know, there have been some setbacks, on the whole this has been something that has helped us to increase living standards. But even with that optimistic measure, I don't think we can take the view that we don't need to do anything. I think the successes of the past have partly been built on the fact that people knew how to respond to them, that they responded to them, they, took, they built the institutions, they took the right policy choices. And so that's what this panel is really about, um, which is about policy. A couple of times this morning people are asking how to, and I think that's really the question for our panelists this afternoon, how to make things work. And here again I think there were three sets of questions that I hope we can tackle. One is to think about skills and the changing demands for skills. Uh, what are the right skills? How do we create them? How do we get the right people to have the right skills? How do we avoid skills mismatch? How do we help people to transition who have one set of skills but will need to, le need to learn another set of skills? And ultimately, if the returns to some sets of skills go up a lot, if inequality increases, do we need to redistribute more? So that's the questions around skills. The second set of questions is about this new paradigm. Do we need to change our social institutions? Are there opportunities? Are there threats to the institutions that we have? How do we bridge the digital divide? How do we get people to adopt technology? So that's the second set of questions. And my third question is really much more broad reaching than that. Is that how do we make growth and, in and inclusion work together? What are the complementarities and what are the potential trade-offs and how should policymakers uh, meet those? So for this panel, I'm going to invite the speakers to talk for about 10 minutes each, uh, and then with the remaining half hour, we'll open it up to questions uh, on Slido, um, and hopefully we'll have a good discussion. Please. Thanks, uh, Sebastian. Um, first of all, uh, let me use this opportunity to welcome you all to Indonesia, and I know some of you are coming in from the different parts of the world, and on behalf of the Ministry of Finance, it's. Uh, it's our uh, great pleasure to uh, welcome you uh, for today's uh, seminar, as well as for those of you who are going to uh, taking uh, or participate in tomorrow's uh, discussion. It's also a, a great welcome to you all in the Indonesia, especially in Yogyakarta. So now, uh, taking some of the questions that you raised, uh, I think uh, the, our Minister of uh, Planning earlier this morning uh, touched uh, very broadly on many different uh, issues. The, um, for Indonesia, I think the uh, skill is very important. This morning, Pak Bambang, the Minister, uh, talks about the, the, the vocational training. Uh, in Indonesia, it's a, 
a very embedded thinking that everyone must go to the to the regular school. So from primary school to high school, from high school all the way until the university, and then taking the uh, degree, and uh, can only work with such degree. Uh, less uh, number of people are willing to take up the vocational education right from the beginning. And there is some sort of a stigma if you are enrolling in the, in the uh, vocational school or uh, at the level of high school vocational. Uh, this is the kind of things that we have to change our mindset. And the government is working hard uh, to promote the vocational training in order to accumulate the skills and, uh, and then eventually skill for uh, productivity. At the same time, uh, the government is also embarking on the uh, massive infrastructure development in Indonesia. Uh, a decade ago, uh, many people uh, believe that uh, Indonesia is lacking of infrastructure. We do not have enough infrastructure to uh, support our development and the current administration came into the office uh, three years ago with an understanding that uh, we will build infrastructure. Right now the infrastructure is being built and is the hard infrastructure as well as the social infrastructure and right now Indonesia is doing the what we call the connectivity infrastructure uh, we call it the palaparing connecting the whole Indonesia to the stream of internet and this is very important in the era of the digital uh, technology it is uh, at the uh, if you look at Yogyakarta the city or if you happen to stop by in Jakarta on your way in here or on your way out of uh, Indonesia these are the modern cities uh, well connected you go to the pub public facilities on the connectivity is is rather good. But if you go outside Java and the connectivity is becoming limited and limited. Uh, so there's a plan of the government to build what we call the Palaparing, uh, which is a connectivity, virtual connectivity of the whole Indonesia, just like uh, in, the, in the mid of 1970s, the government of Indonesia at the time decided that Indonesia must have satellites. So 40 years ago, the government came, came up with a very uh, advanced thinking at that time when only a few countries in the world has uh, satellite. But Indonesia uh, understand that uh, from the west to the east, the only way to put Indonesia together is by putting a satellite. Right now, it's a different era. The only way to put Indonesia together is to put in the connectivity, the virtual connectivity of uh, Indonesia. So we are building that. Uh, as well. So at the same time, it's reaching out the, to the to the people to include as many people in the in the era of technology. Now, those are the infrastructure mindset, and then at the same time, as a policy maker, we are also thinking about the kind of level playing field between the new electronic activities such as the e-commerce. Uh, comparing to the conventional commerce. We are thinking very hard on how to make sure that uh, this new technology is not going to uh, expand, is not going to develop at the expense of the conventional activities. And I think one of the very stark uh, suggestions or numbers was suggested by the Minister of uh, Planning this morning, the number of jobs that will be created versus the number of jobs that will be uh, will be abolished. It's a, a stark comparison. 50 some million uh, gonna be taken away and less than 10 million that will be created. We have to think about how that uh, the conventional economy and the electronic economy or the digital economy can uh, go together. Especially for the Ministry of Finance it's uh, one of the issue is how to put a taxation uh, policy to allow both activities to grow together. They are at the level playing field and one is going to grow 
without the expense of the others. Let me stop here, Sebastian, and we can elaborate further for the, if there are uh, things to elaborate. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for including me in this. I thought this morning's discussion was fascinating and want to take up um, particularly your third question around relating growth and inclusion to bring in one dimension that wasn't as much of a focus this morning. So there's a lot of interest and concern about potential inequality, and a lot of that has been looked at in terms of within country and how different kinds of jobs may be displaced. And the dimension I want to bring in is what about potential inequality between countries? and take a little bit more granular um, understanding of some of the trends that are happening across activities and what that means for some of these policies. You're, you're talking, um, Sebastian, about how there may be this big structural change, and I think we're all convinced that's true, but change is happening at different speeds and in different ways across different activities. So some of the work that we've been involved in is trying to look at manufacturing in particular, because that has historically been the big driver of growth. It's provided a lot of employment for skilled workers and raised productivity. And so one of the big challenges is whether that avenue is still as open going forward. So we saw some of this already this morning, the, the rate of automation and how extensive it is, and that the country that's putting in the most industrial robots is China which traditionally has been the big sort of labor-intensive um, source of, of manufacturing. It also is a technology that's being used very differently across different sectors. So the need to be automating or the need to be taking in different kinds of skills is going to be changing across different sectors. But I think this means two different things. On the, on the one hand, for those sectors or those areas where this kind of technology is being adopted, the sources of comparative advantage and, and what it takes to be an attractive location is going to change. So if low wages is less important in a world where there's really labor-saving technology, what are the other things that we need? So skills and adopting technology are two pieces, but there's a broader agenda this needs to fit into as well. I th the other is that not all sectors are automating or experiencing this same degree of disruptive technology. So for a number of countries, there really is still a window to keep manufacturing and producing using current and existing technologies. So that's sort of the good news. Um, but it is a window that is probably closing. So there is some urgency in being able to take advantage of that time to put in place some of the kind of changes that are going to be needed so that there are opportunities going forward. But I want to talk about two other sort of changes that are happening as well that intersect with technology but give some more insight into the kinds of skills uh, and other kinds of sort of institutions and, and strategies for innovation that are going to matter. And that is what's happening in the links between manufacturing and services. So the, the lines between them are really blurring, and increasingly services are a bigger source of value added and productivity growth within the broader manufacturing value added chains. This isn't new. We've had pre-production services of R&D and design. You have post-production services in terms of marketing and branding and finance, insurance, distribution services. But over time, what's happened is the, the value added in the production, both of the components and assembly, has really decreased over time. And so if you want to, quote, move up in the value chain, it's not so much moving in the production or assembly of one type of good to another, it's moving into these services. And that's where some of the skills are a little bit different. So in terms of this, your question you're posing about matching workers, so taking an assembly line worker and saying, right, now you're going to be a designer, now you're going to be a financial specialist, is difficult. Uh, so I think that's, on the one hand, the right kind of question, but it can also mean different, different ways of trying to get access to these services. And that's where technology itself is potentially another source of opportunity. That an increasing number of services have characteristics that were traditionally associated with manufacturing. 
So more and more services can be traded, particularly digitally traded. Many more of them are themselves a source of productivity growth and innovation, and you can diffuse them actually quite quickly, uh, again, over the internet or mobile devices. And they can, in different degrees, absorb labor too. So the fact that they are more intertwined uh, can actually be a really good opportunity for more productivity growth and more job creation going forward, although some of the ones that are really high productivity are likely to be quite skill intensive. So they may not have quite the same dual benefit that some of the manufacturing has had in the past. And then the last sort of trend that's been happening is what's been happening in trade. So trade um, slowed down dramatically, uh, partly with the financial crisis of a decade ago, and it has been coming back, but trade in goods in particular has rebounded more slowly. And in particular, those sectors that were traditionally very intensive in value chains. So things like computers, electronics, transportation equipment, uh, the, the growth in trade in those sectors has been slower. And one of the questions looking forward with technology is how much that may get exacerbated. That the use, those are some of the sectors where automation is happening most quickly, and some advances um, in more advanced manufacturing goods are happening. And if some of that is being reshored back to higher income countries, what does this mean for lower income countries that are trying to, to get their foot in the door, as it were? Um, you won't necessarily see all the detail in it, but one particular important message, this is looking at different manufacturing subsectors, trying to, to look at how these three different um, trends around automation, serviceification, and intensive trade competition are impacting different sectors. And, and the takeaway message is just, there are some sectors where all three trends are hitting, there are some sectors where really none of these are yet hitting. So the agenda, I think, is one where there's different um, speed uh, across different subsectors, and that's good news for those countries that are in some of these sectors in the bottom left hand. So things like food and beverages, or a lot of sort of regional processing of, of commodities. So when we've been thinking about what's an appropriate policy framework to think about this, we've come up with one that we call the three C's. So it's around competitiveness, capabilities, and connectedness. And much of this is a traditional agenda that many of us have been working on for a long time, but there are pieces of it which are probably that much more urgent if low wages is no longer going to be the same sort of pathway um, to development success as has been in the past. And I'm going to just highlight a couple of things along the lines um, that we were asked to comment on. So the, the competitiveness is a, is a much broader set of indicators you were mentioning how institutions may need to change, and some of this is our regulatory framework and how we think about competition policy in particular. So we have new business models uh, that are being um, rolled out, a lot of gig economy, a lot of online matching, a lot of data online, um, often in the hands of a very small number of enormously large uh, tech platforms. And so how we think about how to regulate that uh, is going to be hugely important in how inclusive some of this growth would be. Right, so if you're Alibaba, on the one hand, you're connecting lots of smaller firms to bigger firms and to consumers, but the algorithms you choose as to which firm comes up on the search when people use it is going to be enormously influential on, on how inclusive that would be. On the capabilities, a lot of this is the skills agenda. There's already been a lot of discussion, so I want to focus um, on the management capabilities. So we care very much about what happens to workers, the kinds of skills they need, but in terms of them also to be employed, what is it that the firms and the management of firms need in order to be able to really grow and adopt technology? And this is something where um, there hasn't been as much attention in the past, but digital technology in particular reinforces. So a lot of smart factories, ones that may use the Internet of Things or data to be able to give real-time feedback loops, require you to be data savvy and, and really understand how to maximize and tweak your production systems in light of that. And that is, unfortunately, where a lot of managers are not as strong. So the surveys that have been done on management skills across, and across firms across now many countries 
Um, that is often one of the biggest determinants of how successful firms are and a huge predictor as to how successful a firm is likely to be in adopting technology. So I think these management capabilities is something that absolutely needs to be put on the, the skills agenda to make sure that technology really is adopted and more of these firms are going to be successful and have the job opportunities for workers to take advantage of. And then one sort of last point um, in terms of some of these institutions and more broadly, what do we need to be able to adopt this technology is um, more on this sort of framework for a, a data ecosystem. Because many of these technologies, again, are, are data-driven and digital, and some of the frameworks we have for how to think about that are still evolving. And this relates to the fact that for many firms, this is uh, often gets referred to as the new oil or new gold in the economy. This is where a lot of value added is. This is what firms really care about, is collecting and owning and manipulating and using the data on all of us and, and their customers. And that needs to then be available for them to use their new uh, technologies and get the efficiency gains, but it needs to be balanced with concerns around privacy, around security, around how this sort of competition and inclusivity is, is done. So I think we need much more understanding that both within a domestic contents, uh, context and absolutely uh, in terms of international. So within this sort of broader framework, um, those would be the points that I'd like to emphasize. Thank you. There we go. I'm going to take the stand, but I'm going to spare you some slides. I just want to talk, if that's OK. 25 years ago, I had the very good fortune of being able to study in Jogjakarta. And in a village, or what used to be a village not far from here, there were two people who used to help me a lot with my language, because I was learning Bahasa at the time. And as I was listening to the presentations this morning, I was trying to imagine how these villagers, who by the way are not simple people, highly intelligent in their respective domains, would respond what words they would use to describe the sorts of things that we've been predicting here today. And there were two words that came forward. The first word was mateni. Mateni. For those of you who speak Javanese or don't speak Javanese, it means frightening, very frightening. And the other phrase that leapt to mind was alon alon. Wat on, clap on, right? Slowly, slowly, as long as it happens. And it will happen. But as I thought on, I thought to myself, well, that's really responding to the unknown. There's fear, but there's also an inevitability about it. And what all of us need when we confront the unknown are in fact frameworks to think through it. And that really is what this audience needs to do because none of us are going to predict exactly what happens. But we do owe our communities a responsibility to go back with frameworks that they can take hold of and use to analyze what is going on around them. And so I'd really like to just spend this next five or 10 minutes to talk to you about transaction costs, because really that's the way I look at things, being a scholar of strategy now. And really this is about changing transaction costs. There's, there's been some excellent work done by Richard Baldwin, the trade economist. Uh, he describes the, the falls in transportation costs that led to the first wave of globalization. Um, and he talks also about falling communication costs, which led to the disaggregation of value chains so that they could relocate from developed countries to developing countries. And he talks also about face-to-face -face costs. But really what he's driving at is that when those constraints change for entrepreneurs, wherever they are in the world, they have to try and make sense of what the new rules of the game are. And it means that there's going to be a hell of a lot of experimentation whenever we get these technological disruptions, this so-called 
disruptive innovation. They have to develop new value propositions as everybody shifts the dial in terms of what they want. So much of what goes on is what we call low-cost innovation, and that's where we take advantage of the new technologies to reduce costs, to drive efficiencies. And that's what feeds this great anxiety, this Ludditism, if you like, or this Luddism, this concern that the semi-skilled will lose their work and that we'll have social unrest. But there's another scenario for this which I'd like to paint for you today, based on two anecdotes. The first is perhaps for one of the most humble professions you'll find in Indonesia, the ojek driver, the man who meets you on the corner with his motorcycle and offers to drive you across town, weaving in and out of the traffic, getting you there ahead of the jam. This character, five or 10 years ago, spent most of his, side, most of his time sitting on his backside, waiting for business. With the advent of Gojek, and that really has come about because of falling communication costs, he has a market which is real and imminent and that spreads across an urban centre rather than being limited to a line of sight to a wandering pedestrian. And that has meant that the productivity of Gojek drivers has absolutely rocketed. But it's not that which I really want you to think about today. It's actually, it's the bridging the gap element that we've been asked to consider. This is a reaching from, if you like, the formal sector into the informal sector in a way that we have never really seen before. Yes, we've had middlemen. Yes, there's been terrific arbitrage opportunities and people have exploited, capitalists have exploited the informal sector. But this enabling is something quite different. Because you see, a man or a woman with a motorcycle who becomes a motorcycle taxi driver is one step away from moving into a new profession, as Gojek has shown us. Because it's only one more step to become a gardener, or a cook, or a masseur, or any number of other occupations that require what Richard Baldwin would refer to as face-to-face -face contact, that, that those face-to-face -face transaction costs start to fall. And that for me is terrifically interesting because without even the wave of the wand by the government or any of our agencies, we actually have semi-skilled, underemployed labor engaging in new professions and looking at new ways to skill themselves. And I think that's absolutely terrific. A lot of what we talk about is about the threat to the semi-skilled. But there was a terrific argument in the, uh, uh, placed in the Financial Times a couple of weeks ago about the sell-side trader. So these are the characters who sat in London and New York and did research on companies and earned fat commissions on trading margins. Very well-paid people. That profession is, has all but disappeared, or is all but disappearing in London. And I think that's, that is a shot across the bows for highly paid professionals. Because what it shows us is that technology can in fact unbundle existing high margin business models in specific professions. And the one I'd like to talk to you about today is the dentist. I had some dental work done last week. It cost me about $500. Didn't bother me all that much because my insurance company paid for it. I'll talk about insurance companies again in a minute. What happened was my dental fillings were removed and new ones were put in. And as he was doing it, because I think about this sort of thing a lot, I thought to myself, really, why is he doing this? And why is it the dental hygienist? because he's basically digging a hole and filling it up again. And I imagine that given that she was a bright person, this is something that she could have done. Leave the root canal work and the new uh, implants and so on to the dentists. But how long will it be before dental hygienists are doing this type of work? It wasn't that long ago that dentists clean our teeth. 
And now, of course, dental hygiene is the work of a completely different group of people. What I've focused on thus far, as I said earlier, is about increasing efficiencies in order to reduce costs, or actually put it slightly differently, the opportunity costs for a supplier in a value chain. Now obviously value creation is a function. The difference between the willingness to pay, below which you will find the price that the client pays, and the below that you will find the opportunity cost for the supplier. There's a wonderful term in Javanese for someone who can't, when they can't be bothered to do something. The term is wukka. So much of what we encounter when we look at underemployment in economies is in fact because people just simply can't be bothered. They don't want to engage. But there's a flip side to this also, and that is new technology can increase willingness to pay. We can create new demand, new markets for products and services. And I think that that is a space that's going to be very exciting for us in the years ahead. So a couple of words to wrap up. The government needs to remain ever vigilant about unhealthy equilibriums. That is to say, spaces where companies maintain a dominant position such that we don't see improvements in human capital. That for me is the fundamental issue that we must address. If human capital is not progressing, we need to crack the whip somehow. We've also got to be incredibly attentive on how we use our youth, particularly the underemployed youth. Pat Basri, some years ago, I met him in London, and he said to me, I don't think he'll mind me saying this, but he said to me, Indonesia has until 2030 to get it right. If it doesn't, after that, the demographic dividend goes. That shouldn't be news to any of you. So finally, I think if there were four points that I really think we need to focus on as we go through this transition where transaction costs are changing, is that we need to maximize experimentation. And what that means is we must maximize participation in markets. We need to be incredibly aware about the formation of new oligarchies. And in that line of thinking, we also need to do our best to continue to make prices transparent. And again, in a low-cost communication age, that really shouldn't be that difficult. We have to make sure also that the players in the market have got skin in the game. My problem with the dental example is that in fact I have no skin in the game. My insurance company takes care of the bill. So I'm a bit impervious if you like. But it's there also that we need to make sure that the insurance industry is demanding uh, the sorts of things that they should be demanding from their clients, from their service providers. Finally, or sec almost finally, trust always comes up. Uh, we need to find ways to develop standards that will enhance the efficiency of our markets, enhance the trust to reduce search and um, policing costs. And I would say here that it's not necessarily the responsibility of government now to intervene, because as we heard this morning, it creates a lot of bureaucracy. An awful lot of this has already been resolved in retail online markets through artificial intelligence, but also through crowd evaluations. I think we're going to see more of that going forward. And finally, when we see a monopoly forming on the internet, as we often will, given the economies of scale, which are prone to accumulate to people, it absolutely must be taxed. I hope the government enjoys that. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much to all three speakers for excellent interventions. Um, we're a little bit short of time, so my plan is the following. Um, I'm going to ask the same question to all three speakers for a fairly quick response. 
Uh, there's a question from the audience that's come in already that I think will be interesting to discuss. And then if we're really good, we can have a third question, but that might be pushing here. So my question, just to kick off, is, is I think one thing that's come across all three presentations is really the challenge for the sort of development model of emerging economies that's been very reliant on manufacturing, maybe FDI in a certain, certain form. Uh, it seems like that's going to be much more challenging in the future. So if you had to name, each issue you can do one, one priority for the new development model that takes into account digital and the fact that some of the old paths are going to be higher, what would that be? Uh, anyone want to go first? So what would you sort of see if you just, one priority intervention that you think would help to address this problem? Swasil, you can go first. Uh, for Indonesia, I think uh, one of the very important uh, step is to find the uniqueness of uh, Indonesia. And of course, uh, uh, if we look around the globe, Indonesia is uh, rather unique in terms of the fact that uh, its geographical uniqueness, uh, its uh, natural, re natural resources, uh, natural endowment, and if we are going to the manufacturing, we should have been using those uh, uh, the natural in, uh, endowment and making the best use of the uh, natural resource that we have. So natural resource-based industry or na natural, yeah, natural resource-based industry should have been our uh, uh, comparative uh, advantage. Uh, I think uh, in this uh, period yeah, we are way uh, past the the old uh, traditional uh, low wage industry. It's going to be all the clerical, all the routines will be taken over by machines, and more and more it will be uh, it will be it's getting obsolete at, even as of now. Uh, but the uh, the 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 processing uh, of the natural resources, I think, is very, is still very open for Indonesia. Uh, the the next one, uh, but you are asking about the manufacturing. But the next one is the services. I agree with the the graph earlier that services will become will be higher and higher in terms of the value in a, in the goods and. Uh, uh, the, the point is more and more of this uh, value added will be even more more and more specifics in the in the future so a country may need may, if we are talking about a specific advantage of a country it it is very possible that it's very specific and this is what the country needs to uh, need to find out uh, further and for that of course the mindset the skills, the innovation will become very, very important if we are going to uh, find our very specific needs in the, in the whole uh, production process. Uh, the other thing that, uh, or let, let me stop there because you are talking about the manufacturing. I'm talking more about the services. Uh, we can take all that later. So, so, so it, was, it was more the, uh, I think a, a real and complicated issue is the challenge from these new technologies to the development model of, of emerging economies, which is kind of what we've been talking about. Uh, focusing on the policy side, what would you see as, you know, if you really had to f pick out one kind of big ticket item on the policy side, what would it be? I mean, the, the word that came to, to so to me, the, the big issue is uh, the innovation agenda and put with that the sort of innovativeness of people. Um, because I think there are an incredible amount of opportunities and people are going to want to um, be able to explore them and go after them. So to me, having the, the right environment that enables new technology to be adopted and to let people be innovative. And to, so that means somewhat more of a flexible system, being able to move to different kinds of activities, bringing their ideas to, to market. Um, and, and so enabling and, uh, and supporting firms, firms and workers really to do new kinds of things. And, and I don't think it means that you have to jump to the frontier. 
So a lot of times when we're talking about an innovation agenda, it's on the frontier and how do you have a whole new product or a whole new way of doing things. And there's tremendous room and scope for productivity growth in a catch-up agenda and taking technology that's out there and adapting it to local conditions. So I think there's enormous scope for being innovative, um, understood that that may be incremental and in, in, a, in a different kind of context. And so I'm sort of, I think there's a lot of opportunity in that agenda. There we go, it's on. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's, it's going to be really important that we see human capital responding to the technological advances. Um, and I hear a lot of people talking about productivity growth, and indeed it is important. But we, almost need, we also need to remind ourselves that in a value chain where willingness to pay spikes, it's also possible to carry higher costs and higher, um, well, higher costs throughout that. And you may, you may see in certain booms within specific sectors, you may actually see uh, a negative impact on productivity for a period. Um, and I think it's, in, it's, it's really important that people are aware that there is, a, there is a learning cycle, if you like, and it will take time for these new technologies and these new ways of doing things to be absorbed. Some of it will happen very quickly and very painlessly, and you might see that at the individual level. But when we're talking about a whole value chain, um, say from the, the farm gate of a farmer in Sumatra all the way through to a, to a palm oil mill, um, you could see a lot of disruption, a lot of uh, social disruption along that value chain as the technology horizon sweeps through those activities. So there is, as I said earlier, there's an element of patience that I think needs to be applied to this and there needs to be a lot more attention to how value chains are adapting to the disruption. Uh, thanks. So I think those were, those were three different answers, but I think all gave some good perspectives on the question. I think for the last question, I want to take the first question, but kind of take that as a given. So that with automation, with technology, I think it's clear that wages will change. Um, some people will benefit, some people won't. Uh, and there's a risk that people with higher skills, broadly speaking, end up doing better than, than the others. So my question is, how should policy respond to that? Um, it's, un it's likely to create a lot of unhappiness. Um, uh, and also will increase social tensions, for example, through higher inequality. What do you think the right policy response to that is? Um, the earlier uh, story by uh, Ed about the Gojek, uh, I think it's a very interesting uh, case, uh, and it's very specific in Indonesia. And uh, the lesson that we can take from that is that uh, uh, this is related to the what, what is which one is the question? How can we? How there, there was there was a question? How can we teach uh, uh, rural people to uh, take advantage of the, the advancement in technology? Gojek is a very nice example. I mean, like uh, ten years ago, nobody think that uh, an object driver will be playing with their uh, cellular phone. Now they do, and then uh, it only takes uh, only takes one entrepreneur to introduce a very simple applications, and then all of a sudden everyone sign up. Now Gojek uh, claims that they have 500,000 merchants. Uh, the uh, Ojek driver, the taxi driver, the uh, food uh, restaurants, even you have uh, in one of the applications you have the go massage. You can have your massage at home uh, by uh, asking from the from the apps, and it requires no massive education. People learn it. Uh, people react to the apps. It's simple, and people know that, that they can make money out of that, and just people just jump on it. Uh, so I think what the government needs to prepare is to provide the connectivity, good. Uh, environment, good infrastructure, good connectivity. At some point, we have to think about the uh, consumer protection. 
and at some point the government needs to think about the level playing field. Uh, the conventional commerce in the malls or stores and others conventional stores if uh, and then all of a sudden there is a marketplace there is a, me a social media there is a classified ads uh, and so on the question really to the government is that do the government think that they are all level playing field uh, and it is very important the level playing field in terms of the consumer protection in terms of the taxation in terms of the uh, the uh, importing goods uh, or services uh, later. So there's a question about level playing field that the government needs to, to, to answer. Now, this, some of these people from the electronic commerce came to the government at this time, came to my office and then asking, we are a very, uh, in the very early stage of development, so why don't the government give us some incentives? Uh, the response to the government will be very, very critical at that point what kind of incentives that we are talking about. Because five years from now, if not faster, uh, five years from now, some other modes of transaction will appear in the, in the world. Uh, new innovation will come, and then this in new innovation will ask for protection, will ask for incentives. And then it's very critical that uh, for a new innovation, the government come up with a clear idea of what is the level playing field of economic activities uh, of the, the new one in comparison with the conventional or the older way of economic transaction? If that is, the, that is really the question. Uh, so in addition to providing infrastructure, providing the mindset, providing the skills, the government needs to think about the level playing field of new innovation uh, and, or new transaction. Uh, in comparison with the, the old one. Now, in Indonesia, we are not thinking about how can the electronic commerce can uh, pay tax in the level playing field as the commercial transaction. That is a very tough, uh, uh, that is going to be a tough and challenging question for a country like Indonesia. And then we just, we're just uh, thinking about that, but I think, uh, a level playing field is very important. We don't want the electronic commerce to increase, to develop, to expand at the expense of the conventional or the traditional uh, commerce. So usually if certain groups are able to earn higher returns than others, there's a lot of interest in moving into those activities and eventually sort of supply and demand will re-equilibrate. So I guess the question, if that's not happening, is why? And so part of it, the answer has got to be, are you sure that these opportunities really are as open as they could be? So that may be partly a skills agenda. It may be a connectivity. So certainly if some parts of the world or some parts of a country are not able to have the basic ability to connect, that would be part of the agenda to make sure that those kinds of opportunities are open. Um, on the flip side, uh, if it's not so much on labor, but because of capital, or this is the owners of, uh, say, the Googles of the world, they sort of particular, so it's capital and it's particular companies that are extremely large and are successful in no small part because of the network effects. And they work because their machine learning works because everybody's using their platform. And this is some of the sort of new challenge to some of our competition authorities about how to think about that. Right? So consumers, on the one hand, are, betting, are benefiting, um, but if incredible rents are accruing, uh, some kind of policy to redistribute would seem to be an, an appropriate one. Um, but I think, in, in general, this, this sort of other question is not a new one around redistribution, and governments around the world have adopted different, different ideas um, on that, whether there's a certain floor, a certain basic services that are supplied or certain levels of income or different kinds of progressive tax systems. I don't, I don't think any of that debate is going to end. Um, I think there's going to be that much more attention on making sure opportunities are open and again how we deal with potentially different kinds of monopolies that may be a little bit harder to regulate but that will need to be to really ensure there is that inclusive opportunity.
There we go, Tom. So when we talk about monopolies, really what we're talking about are symmetries of power. And for today's discussion, when we're talking about so much of it is about communication and falling communication costs and so on, it's about the symmetries of knowledge. Uh, a couple of weeks back, or a couple of months back, I had some discussions with an Australian bank and, and the regulator about fintech, uh, about big data. And I'd just like to paraphrase to you very quickly how I felt about those discussions, what was said. The regulator said, we are, excuse me, makes me emotional. We are a law enforcement agency and we have the data, beware. The bank privately said, we have the data, but we don't know what to do with it. But the consumer, I started thinking about myself, I started thinking about you know, the man in the street, the woman in the street, how do they feel about all of this? Well, actually they feel, I think, a little bit uncomfortable being watched at every moment, you know, where you go on the internet, where you spend. And I started thinking about my bank statement, and I got really angry. Not because I had no money in the bank, but because fundamentally my bank statement hasn't changed in over a hundred years. It's completely illegible. I don't know if you feel that way, but I really do think it's completely illegible. And there's something that's going to happen in that space very soon. In the UK you can see the emergence of open banking, where individuals will own their bank account numbers, not, not the bank, but the individual which means that they'll be able to move between banks. And that's going to put the pressure on the banks and other oligarchic elements to start empowering consumers so they don't feel desperate about this big change in technology. And if they were to do that, just think about the ramifications again for human capital, where the average punter can actually analyze where their cash flows are going in a month. They know that they spend a bit too much on groceries. I mean, the, the behavioral implications for this are actually quite profound. And I think governments, they need, to, they need to think perhaps less about financial literacy than pathways towards terms or concepts like they have in New Zealand, which is financial capability. And it's through that that I think that we're going to have a more balanced relationship with the very large monopolies which are emerging, and perhaps uh, a more productive relationship also with government. Okay, so one thing the digital revolution doesn't solve is the shortage of time. Uh, so unfortunately we're going to have to draw this to a close. I, I won't attempt to summarise what I think has been a very rich discussion, but I think we should thank our panel for their excellent contributions. Thank you. And now I am inviting the moderator to proceed and I also invite you uh, all participants to participate in our discussion through slido.com as usual, hashtag VTI Seminar 20. And with courtesy, I am inviting the moderator, Mr. Vikram Haksan, to proceed. Let me try again. Sanamat Sore. It's, it's uh, thank you so much for the great privilege that you've given me to uh, moderate this uh, last session. It's been a really fascinating morning listening to all the discussions on these uh, very hard questions actually. So it's, a, it's a quite a challenging topic and um, I think we've heard a lot about the assessment of how technology transforms economies and has implications for the labor markets and outcomes for employment. And uh, in our last session also I think we've had a lot of interesting discussion about some of the policy issues including at the country level and many solutions have been thought about in terms of uh, dealing with the effects of technology. Technology brings many benefits, but also there are trade-offs. And uh, I think we've heard some very innovative thinking about uh, topics ranging from human capital issues to flexibility. So this last session, 
we have asked the question, what does this mean for international cooperation? And we have a very distinguished panel from both the public and private sectors who are going to speak to us today. So without further ado, let me invite them all up on the stage, please. All right, gentlemen, why don't we get right to it? So maybe if I could call first on, um, on uh, Mr. Alejandro, from the, from, uh, our colleague from Argentina, to come and speak to us about uh, how you see the issues on the international policy coordination with the presidency of the G20. on? Yes, now it is. Hi. So thank you, Vikram, and thank you to our hosts for uh, uh, hosting this wonderful event. Yeah, and um, I am honored to be here to represent the Argentine presidency of the G20, which um, is taking the rotating presidency for the year of 2018 coinciding with the 10-year anniversary of the financial crisis, which for us has meant that, in a way, it's a time for reflection, it's a time for stop-taking, and uh, also it's a, an opportunity to craft a positive, forward-looking agenda. And uh, it is with that in mind that we chose as one of the priority topics for our year, the topic of the future of work. We are at a time, as we have heard, of extraordinary advances in technology, in terms of both pace and scope, which are already reshaping the global economy, and which provide an opportunity to boost economic growth and improve living standards, but they also entail large impacts on the labor market and present major challenges to regions and sectors across the world. Now, the G20 has among its mandates that of achieving strong, sustainable, balanced, and inclusive growth, and boosting the opportunities of technologies and mitigating the challenges is a natural topic to address in that sense. For us, this is a presidency-wide priority that our president and our government cares deeply about. As other countries, we have a commitment, and uh, this is aligned with a zero-poverty mandate in our, own, in our own country. As a side note, I heard earlier that if, uh, if we had to choose very few measures to take, what would one of those be? Someone said uh, infrastructure. And people have also spoken about transaction costs and inclusiveness. And uh, just as a side note, one of the other priorities that the presidency has chosen for this year is that of infrastructure, including infrastructure finance and also access to digital infrastructure, which is also a key component if we're going to make this technology transition work for all. Now, Coming back to the specific topic of uh, technology and its impact on the future of work, it has been said that many of the problems and disasters of the last century were due to something that's been called a failure of the imagination. And we also heard today that we don't know what we don't know, 
And it is with that humility and with that responsibility that we need to work on readiness and on preparedness. And I don't mean just to anticipate what will happen, but actually to shape what will happen. It has also been said that policymakers like to get ready to fight the last war as a metaphor of taking policies that have worked to solve the problems in the past. So let's actually escape that and look forwards and consider what policies we may need to tackle the problems of the future and then to consider whether we are ready to implement those policies if needed. Now, that is the core of why we think it is relevant to take the discussion on the future of work to the policy, to the international uh, stage at this time, because neither the gains nor the risks from technological advancements are inevitable. I think Sebastian nailed this right on the head uh, when he was moderating the previous panel, when he introduced the idea that it is, it is actually up to, to us, to the policymakers, to shape the outcomes. We have, we have heard of technology as a threat, we have heard of technology as a promise, and uh, there are increasingly a number of us that are neither optimists nor pessimists. We think that really we need to shape this with our decisions. So what, agreement is, what agreements is there, if any? Firstly, there is agreement that there already is an impact on the workplace in many places, that uh, the, the types of work that we are seeing uh, today are different from those of the past. Some people in, in advanced markets will have shorter careers. Some, uh, some in some other places, we will see the effects of the gig economy. Uh, we may see the effects of informality, self-work, more flexibility. We are also seeing some distributional consequences. Um, in the long run, there's also agreement that technology should provide a positive uh, consequence for workers, but that in the meantime we may experience a transition where some will struggle to, sh to share in the gains until we implement adequate policy responses. And uh, I think this is something that we heard about earlier as well, which has to do with what history teaches us. And I think the real lesson of history is, again, that uh, technology uh, transitions do come with their share of um, more or less disruption, but eventually with the need to take policy action that is at the scale uh, required in terms of scope, in terms of pace, uh, and in terms of scale, to the challenge of the time. Um, so, in terms of what we're going to discuss at the G20 level, firstly, we know that this is a common challenge. It's a global phenomenon that affects us all. The spillovers can be quite significant. Uh, it can have effects on global inequality, on migration, on political and economic instability, and a lot of this has to do with the impact on inclusiveness and whether this can affect inclusive growth. Um, there is also an important, an important role for knowledge sharing. Members are already implementing uh, some interesting policies domestically on this area, and there is much to be learned from other members on the best ways to seize the opportunities, the opportunities and tackle the challenges afforded by technological change. And uh, there is a, rec a recognition that we all care about the transition and about not leaving people behind. And thirdly, there are some very specific areas where there are positive effects of joint action. Certain policy areas which are more effective or can only be effective if addressed in a coordinated way. And examples include international taxation, especially in relation to the dig digitalizing economy, or they can include uh, industrial policy, they can include the regulation of intangibles, regulatory frameworks for new technologies, such as autonomous vehicles, data policy, 
and uh, the flow of data uh, internationally, competition policy, um, and also monitoring and data policy, so having consistent databases for monitoring technological trends and their impacts. So having said that, um, we, are, we have taken this priority as something that we're going to look at both on the finance track and the Sherpa track of the G20. Within the finance track, we hope to advance the global discussion and understanding of this issue and to get to increase our preparedness and our readiness in terms of the menu of policy options available to members, both in terms of knowledge sharing of domestic measures and in terms of coordination of international measures. Um, and the examples of the policy areas that we're going to look at are those that we have heard of today, including taxation, benefit systems, data policy, innovation policy, and competition policy. And we hope that by doing this, we will address, first acknowledge, and then address the anxiety that we already know and feel in, uh, in our citizens and in workers across the globe, and turn this into an opportunity agenda, turn this into finding in which way we will need to respond in order to get out of this frame of thinking that jobs are scarce, that high quality work is some, something scarce and actually make work plentiful and uh, move to a world of better, higher quality jobs that people actually choose to work on rather than have to work on. And that is our objective for uh, the presidency this year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alejandro, for so clearly laying out uh, the directions and priorities that Argentina has uh, on this very important topic. If I could turn next to Paul uh, to share the Canadian perspective with us on the, on the issue. Thank you very much. Um, let me start by saying it's, it's a real honor to be here in Jogjakarta, uh, in a, a beautiful city, and thank you very much for the invitation. I think there are some slides coming up behind me there uh, in a moment. Um, I just want to make a few observations about, um, first of all, the dynamics around inequality and technology, some of the examples of how Canada is looking at this in our own policy context, uh, and, then, and then draw some observations around international cooperation. So um, while the slides come up here, do I need to press this? Okay, so um, in the absence of that, let me just um, say what I wanted to say, and it'll, I'm sure it'll come up in a moment behind us. Um, I wanted to make a couple of points about what was said on inequality and technology. So the first point on inequality that I wanted to stress was that as we saw this morning, typically the... Um, all right, next slide, please. Somebody has the controller now. Um, can you move to the next slide? All right, somebody took it um, from me. Could you please bring it back or, or change the slide? Um, the inequality issue, as we heard this morning, is that in general, the world is getting richer. It's, and there is uh, largely a, a decline in inequality between countries. There's an interesting, um, thank you very much. There's an interesting comment that you often hear when you talk to young people about how is the quality of your life, and you talk to them about would you like to be richer back many, many years ago, or would you like to have your cell phone? And the answer is probably obvious to you that they want the cell phone. So there's, there's a sense here, now we're not talking about the poorest of the poor, as we heard this morning, but, but those also have been uh, making significant uh, progress. 
Secondly, income inequality has generally risen within countries. Now, we heard examples this morning again that that's not always the case. Um, some countries are managing still to, to deal with inequality within their borders. But I, I, would, I would argue that there are still very important inequality considerations going on within those borders, where there's still dynamics around winners and losers. There's still dynamics around weakening of the middle class, potentially. There's a question of, of market power of large corporations, of the 1%. There are dynamics of inequality in, in, within borders of, of every country that I can tell, and, and within the G20 countries. Um, the causes of inequality certainly include technological change, and hasn't been mentioned that much this morning, but globalization is, is an important part of the inequality mix. Secondly, on technology, um, technological change is central to productivity, uh, growth and rising living standards. There's, there's really no debate. History has shown this time and time again. Secondly, the application of technology can lead to reductions or increases in inequality. It's in a way neutral. It's really about how it's used. And I think the question now before us is that there's an expectation that there's a wave of transformational technologies moving forward and we're expecting them to have a big impact on inequality, but it is again going to come down to how they are used in policy. Now, I've just got a, a couple of more um, quick points to make, really. Um, the next one is to say a couple of things about the Canadian situation. Now, we heard about you know, the, the threat to jobs, right? And typically, people think of this in terms of routine, you know, kind of almost mechanical kind of jobs versus the non-routine manu manual jobs and then the non-routine cognitive jobs. When we look at the Canadian situation over the last couple of decades, there has definitely been a movement from routine jobs to the other categories. And let, let me define what those are here briefly. So routine would be things that can be codified by kind of a machine learning kind of, kind of function. And a good example of that is an accountant, um, which are, sorry to say if anyone's an accountant in the room, you're likely to you know, have your profession quite changed over time. Another one would be cashiers, um, you know, people working at kind of machines pressing buttons, but we heard the important caveat this morning about automatic teller machines that, of course, it looked like those were going to replace bank tellers, but it played out quite differently. So there's no kind of linear correlation between jobs and job loss. Um, Non-routine cognitive jobs, such as uh, software programmers, are the biggest beneficiaries in terms of growth uh, in jobs in Canada. Um, and non-routine manual jobs, as such as support workers, etc., have also done very well. Now, those have led to a fairly smooth transition in the Canadian case because job um, job levels have remained quite, quite robust during that period. So there hasn't been an overall job loss particularly, and people have managed to shift uh, between functions. Now the important point here is um, that early policy action is, is really important to get in the right direction. The next uh, slide that I have here is my second to last one. Um, really wanting to stress um, the point that I think was touched on in most uh, conversations this morning around the expected impacts and the policy implications. Now, the expected impa impacts have quite a broad universe ranging from growth, gains in well-being, including displacement of workers, the changing nature of work on the left on the left hand side, you see here higher inequality, very potentially, anti-competitive effects, privacy and security threats. Um, and then the policy implications also have a huge range of, of issues here, ranging from innovation and adaptation to education and skills, social and labor market policies, tax and transfer system, regulations. I think we heard all of those this morning. And I think the important point here is it really does need to be integrated. A lot of the conversations that are going on now tend to be in one or two of those spaces, but it's rarely done in a much more holistic way. And I think that's one of the important learnings from this conversation. And from the ones we're having around this. Now, I won't go into the details on this slide, but some of the policies that you can consider, again, Canadian examples, are ones that I think stress the point that was made this morning again, and that is focus on the worker and not the job. 
So how would you, how do you tackle inequality issues, wage subsidies, labor market earnings disparities, improving employment protection, education and skills, of those kinds of things. Now the final slide, because I know I, I don't have much time here, is to, is to get into a couple of points on international collaboration. Um, technologies and leading technology firms have definitely made borders a little less obvious. Integrated global value chains are probably more sophisticated, more complex, and more pressing than ever. There's a, there's a real driver for international collaboration in this context. I would point out that it's, it's quite amazing how many things are going on already in terms of international collaboration. Technology has a very developed space here. Intellectual property, international trade, telecommunications, countless bilateral arrangements between countries. Um, there are many international organization initiatives. We heard about the G20 priorities of Argentina this year. Canada is the presidency for the G7. Future of work is also a priority there. So there, there is a lot going on, and as I mentioned, I think future of work kind of frames that more integrated conversation around technology and inclusiveness in a way that is providing some value added. Um, finally, I would just note a couple of things that I think are gonna be picked up on in this discussion, and that is things that clearly do require more coordination as we move forward. Things like data ownership and privacy, competition policy and trade, taxation and the digital economy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. That was a, a super uh, overview of uh, how important the issue is in an integrated world. And I think uh, you lay out also the balance between the opportunities from technology, but some of the challenges in dealing with the equity issues as well. And I think that sets us up very nicely for the intervention by Parmahendra, who I think is going to challenge some of us and some of, our, uh, some of the thinking that we have in this topic. Amahendra, please, uh, as you wish. You can sit here or there, as you wish. Thank you, Vikram. I don't have slides, but uh, I had uh, too much uh, big lunch, so I prefer to stand. Well, let me start by saying that um, since I left the government, and with that, the task of being the G20 Sherpa three years ago, I went and lived in San Francisco for one year and managed a venture capital investing in technology startups in the Silicon Valley area. And then I went to London, lived there for seven months, doing more or less the same. Now I'm back in Jakarta, I have a couple of new roles, but I'm still engaged with the tech sectors, among others, advisor of Indonesia's two unicorns. For the record, unicorns means a startup that has valuation over one billion US dollars. So, I, based on my two lives, over 25 years being part of the government, the regulators, and the last three years being the tech sector, I come to this couple of conclusions. First, the G20 is not the proper setup to discuss tech developments, including FinTech, let alone being an objective facilitator to promote the tech prospect. Why? Because historically, the G20 at the ministerial and central bank governance level originated because of the Asian monetary crisis. And the summit level was because of the global financial crisis. So their main concerns are macro and micro prudential. And then financial institutions misconducts and how to improve their risk management system so that Financial institutions will no longer or cannot make another crisis in the future. And of course, how to sustain and maintain financial sector stability. So that is the background of the G20. Meanwhile, the presence of the tech startups, including the fintech, is to disrupt the established practices of the industry's incumbents. 
That's why they are there. Because of the failure of the incumbents in realizing the real potential of the industry's concern in terms of technology utilization, customers' coverage, especially the poor and those without access, and too rigid business process, in which 90%, 99% of which, thanks to the regulator and the policymakers. Now, let's look at an example. Indonesia today, still, the know your customer process has to have face-to-face -face process, despite talking about so much benefit of having smartphones and any other communication uh, devices. And then P2P lending is still not considered doable if it's not bankable. And just forget about cryptocurrency. That is just out of the course question at all. It's because from regulator's perspective, these are just risk, risk, and systemic risk. But this is not only happen in Indonesia. Let's use another example of other industry. I'm using the ride-sharing online transportation. In Indonesia, since President Jokowi took place or took uh, the office, we have two ministers of communication or transportation, we call it. The first one issued a decree in the morning to ban ride-sharing online tech companies. But in late afternoon, the same day, he had to withdraw it because the president was so upset about it. And then the new minister, which is the current one, issued the same regulation, saying that these all tech startups can operate if they transform and becoming taxi companies. And then, not the president, but even more surprisingly, find the Supreme Court annulled that decree. So you just imagine, if the Supreme Court is more reform-minded than the officials, you know the quality of the reform. But as I said, Indonesia is not alone. We have friends from Canada, which Toronto, after six years of banning Uber, only in 2016, even only partial recognized the presence. And in Buenos Aires, up to now, the online transportation is still a dream to be true. Now, on that issue, also talking about, again, Indonesian context, we have Gojek, the first Indonesian unicorn. Now, Gojek has presence in 25 of Indonesian cities all over the country. That's the good news. The bad news, they are considered illegal in 24 of them. So, despite the reality that compare Gojek, Valuation, and Garuda Indonesia, the flag career with 150 planes, plus Bluebird, the largest taxi driver in Indonesia with 23,000 vehicles, these two, let's say, blue chip company market capitalization is just half of Gojek valuation. So these are the reality which I think need to awaken up the regulators, the policy makers, and of course, with that, the G20. Now, with that in mind, what to do? I would say that first, the G20 and other international organizations have to realize that the regulators, the policy makers, are self-constraint and self-limitation to themselves. So what needs to be done is, of course, like this is a concrete suggestion, to colleague from Argentina during its presidency. Argentina and I just learned, and I think we have to read this week, The Economist, because it's full of explanation how 
even regulators now have the so-called anti-tech platform. And call the tech companies are just too big, too monopolistic, anti-democracy, underpaid taxpayer, and you name it. The suggestion is rather than tasking the regulators and the policy makers on this issue, which I understand also President Macri is a reform-minded person, including for the tech sector, put aside the online transportation. He and like-minded fellow leaders like our President Jokowi can join with other few leaders and then find and form an independent, reputable and uh, credible uh, team of expertise and then invite the tech people to engage and identify the real issues. I think this is very rare opportunity where we have the president and the presidency of the G20 is really a reform champion, including for the tech sector. And with that, I think if you have done that, I might, might not be well informed. I would say congratulations. If you haven't done that, please consider it. If you are not going to do it, it doesn't really matter. Because the tech companies will prevail, but obviously it would not be as optimal and as fast as you expected. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pam Mahendra. I think uh, sometimes in these debates we have to remind ourselves that uh, the glass is half full and some parts of it may be half empty. Uh, maybe it's two-thirds full, one-third empty, but uh, it's, sometimes, it's useful not to just focus on the challenges and problems, but also the opportunities that the technology offers us. And I think that, uh, that certainly is, uh, is, very, is very well taken. So maybe actually speaking further to the opportunities that the technology has to offer, uh, we have a, uh, maybe I could invite Ruben to come and tell us a little bit about uh, the perspective from uh, the side of the private sector and Facebook in particular actually on this particular question. Thank you. Thank you Vikram. Uh, I think I was just waiting for uh, my presentation to, to come up. But uh, very difficult to, to follow Pat Mahendra, but thank you Pat Mahendra for, for speaking on behalf of some of the tech companies. I thought I was, I will be the only one that's speaking on behalf of the tech company and walked into a trap. But uh, for, for, I think for many um, visitors here from outside of Indonesia, what, what most don't realize is where the, the city where we are in Jogja is actually, uh, is, is more than 100 universities actually exist in Jogja. That um, consists of polytechnics as well. Uh, you know, many, many top, top-notch universities are here as well. One of the biggest challenges for Jogja, I did, I've done a lot of work here in Jogja with my previous company as well, uh, working with the local startups, is that uh, the intellectual flight that actually leaves Jogja, although there's a lot of scholars and a lot of, um, you know, government officials actually comes out of educated, being educated in Jogja, none are actually contributing back in here. Uh, what is interesting enough, in, actually in the past few years, given the, um, uh, Jogja being one of the most, um, well, one of, the, one of the most creative cities in, in Indonesia, we've seen an influx of jobs coming back here in Jogja as well. Pak Mahendra spoke briefly about, about Gojek as well. Uh, you know, some of the developers of Gojek are actually residing here in Jogja as well. So there's definitely a, a, a change in, in uh, you know, how, how technology is also changing the landscape, uh, the, the industry itself. Now, um, I've been at Facebook for more or less than, than three months, but my experience working in, in other tech companies, I think, range uh, of six years. It's, it's an exciting time to actually work in tech, especially in Indonesia, because I think the real impact of what technology can bring is, is, is really evident. Uh, in, in many parts of Indonesia, not only in the big cities, but also uh, as we shift towards the, the, the most eastern part and the remote places of, of Indonesia as well. Um, how, do I, how do I do this? 
Can someone help me press next? So uh, I'm pretty sure everyone knows here, this is uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, you know, the founder of Facebook. Uh, the reason why I put this up here is that as of last year, 2017, I think our mission statement has significantly changed. Uh, you know, Facebook has been around for 30 years. In the past, we were always focused on connecting people, right? That is, that is the very foundation of Facebook. You know, you connect with friends and families from all over the world. But I think one big flaw that we found throughout the way is that people are becoming more and more isolated through the technology that we use. So more importantly, I think this year, uh, and, and moving forward as, 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 as a country is that, uh, sorry, as, as a company, we want to partner with countries and governments as well on like how do we actually build communities to actually bring the world closest together. So that is our, our mojo coming uh, for, for 2018 and, and moving forward. Now, excuse me. So this is some, some numbers of Facebook. I, I, uh, and, you know, Bob Mahendra actually touched on some of the starting figures um, of, of many tech companies. Just to give you an idea, as I said earlier, Facebook is only 13 years old, will be 14 in, in February next month. Um, but some of the areas, uh, uh, the, the size uh, of Facebook, uh, you know, with, with more than 2 billion people using Facebook at the moment, uh, you know, 1.3 billion people are actually on WhatsApp. Uh, Instagram is actually one of the, the, the highest, uh, the, the biggest growth for our family of apps. And in most countries such as Indonesia, um, you know, the uptake of Facebook is becoming more and more rapid. Now, I have to say that uh, the, the interesting figure in the past few years is that actually the uptake of, of, of Facebook and technology is not as drastic as in the previous years where we actually introduced the platform. Uh, this is for various reasons, but I think ultimately the reasons actually boils down to, to these three features is largely about the connectivity barriers. And I think I, the reason why I throw this up, and, and this is pose a, a certain discussion points that we, um, you know, many of the tech companies can work very closely with, um, with, with some of the governments that exist in, in G20. The first and foremost, I, I, I think it's largely about awareness. Um, this is super crucial. For many emerging markets, uh, such as Indonesia, the gateway to the internet, the gateway to the World Wide Web is largely around Facebook or other uh, platforms. And the reality is that people out there, um, in most eastern parts of Indonesia, they don't know how to make use of technology uh, to the, its optimum benefit. Uh, the second one is affordability. I know some of the speakers earlier spoke about accessibility, right? Uh, at Facebook and some of the tech companies that, that we work with is that we feel that there's not much point to discuss about accessibility if people in this most remote places will not be able to afford um, data packages and, and the devices as well. And then lastly, some of the things that, that we will be touching on will be roughly around infrastructure. Now touching back on the, on the second part of the connectivity barriers, with regards to affordability, some of the figures here is uh, some, some, some of the starting figures with regards to, to some of the costs of accessing data as well. Uh, you know, more and more technology is being rolled out, mobile, set, mobile handsets, um, you know, having 4G capabilities, but ultimately what we're seeing is that 4G handsets are not being used to its optimum ability as well. This is the the current state of connectivity around the world. So I think the world has around about 7.5 billion people. Uh, at the moment, only 3.4 billion people are connected. The biggest challenge for all of us, I think for Facebook and the, the governments here around G20, is that how do we actually tap into the resources we have to connect more and more people around the world. Now the next slide that I would like to, to share that without getting too technical, I think this is all about the, um, with regards to the infrastructure. Um, companies such as Facebook, we don't have any religious views on how to connect the world. Uh, we're here to actually partner with governments and maybe telco companies as well. Um, basically, there are a thousand one ways to actually connect the world, let's put it that way. Uh, when we actually work with one particular organization to promote certain technology, 
is often seen by many governments and many uh, telco companies that were taking their, their market share. So I'll give you that this is a this is a, a quite an interesting illustration. And um, in Jogja as well, we've worked with it in my previous work. Uh, we've worked with uh, local developers here as well to actually roll out some uh, technology which was called TV white space to actually use. Um, you know, low frequency, unused analog TV frequencies to actually push data as well. We, we, we lo would love to actually work with the various governments here to actually come up with some solutions as well on how to be best use of this. This is the latest uh, program that we've rolled out. Um, I'm happy to share that here in Indonesia, uh, th this program is called Free Basics. Uh, Free Basic is something that we've partnered very closely with many telco companies. It, it's essentially it's a win-win situation. Uh, some people were actually raising some issues of, regarding around competition. Well, this is actually a partnership that actually showcases how tech companies are actually working with telco companies to actually work on uh, pushing out uh, connectivity uh, in the most remote places. In short, what this actually means is that you know, if you connect to your Facebook apps uh, using Telcom, Telcom Cell uh, or XL or Indosat as well, these are the, the three top providers here in Indonesia, you can essentially access Facebook free of charge. The only difference is that you won't be actually accessing the video as the, and, and, uh, the video and the pictures, but if you do want to actually access that, you will actually just have to let your providers know. It is a win-win situation as well for many of the telco companies because this is actually their gateway to actually attract more consumers. So this is some of the, the programs that we are actually uh, partnering with telco consumers all over the world. Now, I think the last piece that I really want to touch on is actually the work that we are working with uh, many small medium businesses around the world and especially in Indonesia as well. Um, you know, out of the, the 2.1 billion users that we have in Facebook, uh, 70, 70 million of them are actually small medium businesses uh, that exist on our platform. This actually varies from, you know, the moms and pop shop, uh, you know, advertising or, or using our platform to reach more audiences, but also to the large corporations as well to actually use our advertising uh, services as well to actually market their, their products and services. In Indonesia, uh, you know, uh, a country that we've been operating for, uh, for a few years, we've actually gone out to the most remote places, but also to the major cities as well. We've covered about 15 cities in, and, and worked with 13 partners as well. In the last year alone, we actually uh, partnered and, and trained with um, trained 15,000 um, small medium businesses as well. What has been super challenging in countries like Indonesia is actually finding the right partner in the government. Uh, small medium enterprises or SMB is a super sexy um, uh, you know, area for, for many governments to, or agencies to actually jump into. Uh, I, you know, in Indonesia alone, we've worked with the Ministry of Trade, we've worked with the Ministry of Labor, we've even worked with the BKPM as well, Bamaendra. All of these institutions seem to actually having um, you know, one hand or the other on the, on the rise of the small medium businesses as well. Some interesting figures about you know, how Facebook support the SMBs as well. You know, what we've known, uh, what we've realized as well is that the, the, the benefit of, of using digital platforms as well is the data that is collected and how you can actually uh, advertise some of, some of the things. I, I, I won't go into, into a, a, a you know, commercial spill, but some of the, some of the, the interesting figures is that 80% of there's increased sales, uh, you know, cross-border data, is, this is something that actually hasn't been uh, actually highlighted here as well. We're also seeing a huge trend um, of, of, you know, Indonesian uh, businesses actually going abroad and using our platform to actually market their products and services as well. And lastly, I will actually leave you with, with this final slide. This is, a, this is a, a lady that we trained in Surabaya. Uh, you know, she lost her husband, um, you know, a, a few years ago. But what she's been, what she actually has the, uh, the, the, the skill to do is actually to bake cakes. 
And, 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 and this, we work with the, the city of Surabaya to actually trade her, and we work with our, lo our local partners as well. And what she's doing now is that she's actually ask, um, basically tripled her revenue in the past uh, year that she's been partnering with Facebook and, and, and the city of Surabaya. So these are super uh, interesting, um, basically, activities that, that we are working on. And just to actually, uh, you know, close uh, my, my, my quick presentation, um, some of the things that, that I would like to raise is that, you know, uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, tech companies, we are super happy to work with, with you know, countries and governments such as G20. Uh, I think where it, it be, be, becomes quite a problem is that I think for many tech companies, we just don't have the right channel of who to engage, right? Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you the case of, of Indonesia. You know, we, we deal with the, with the Ministry of ICT, we deal with with BKPM, and we deal with various channels as well. I think more concerted uh, effort. I think it will, it will be very useful as well. I also like the idea of Butminder uh, suggested as well that we are more than happy to actually work with um, with with some of the the top officials to actually bring some of the recommendations. So with that, I will leave it at that and maybe open the rest for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. I hadn't realized that Facebook had uh, 70 million small businesses around the world. Uh, it's a different perspective. And uh, I was talking with some other colleagues in the break, and uh, Facebook is one part of it, but there's also companies like uh, Tencent and WeChat, and uh, the, the owners of WeChat in China, where these kind of platforms are creating many opportunities. But um, maybe let me turn uh, next to, uh, to our colleague Fu from the ILO, who's written a great deal about um, the uh, tech transformation in uh, Southeast Asia and what it means for workers and labor markets in the region, and uh, 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 ask him for his perspectives. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, first, let me take this opportunity to uh, thank the Ministry of Finance for uh, inviting, uh, inviting me to be here, uh, giving a chance for the ILO to uh, share some of our perspectives on the future of work. Um, to talk about this issue of international cooperation and how we can leverage technology um, to make sure that the future work is inclusive, uh, let me start by giving a little bit of context. Um, over the last year and a half, uh, there have been uh, 110 national policy dialogues around the world uh, organized by ministries of labor, uh, business associations, and workers' organizations around the future of work. Uh, here in this region, I was able to uh, you know, participate in a number of them. And um, in each of the different uh, policy dialogues, the issues that came up were very diverse. You know, some countries were highly consumed in the idea of jobs and automation, what it meant for uh, the future of employment. Other countries were talking about the, uh, the potential for automation and AI as a tool to address some of the demographic challenges that they're facing and the aging of their labor, for, uh, labor forces. Um, in other countries, the primary concern was about the governance of the labor market and the changing employment employee relationship and how that was being transformed by the rise of the gig economy. Uh, but one message that was very clear and was consistent across all these different forums was that international cooperation is needed now more than ever. Uh, there's a strong sense that we're moving into uncharted territories. Uh, many of the countries, especially those of the emerging economies, the developing economies, made it clear that uh, there's still a lot of constraints that they face in terms of uh, financial constraints, uh, technical constraints to address some of these issues. So the importance of uh, multilateral partnerships, cooperation was really emphasized. Uh, there's also this, um, this call for more experience sharing, sharing of best practices. Uh, even if certain countries uh, in the advanced economies were just a few steps ahead uh, on this path of figuring out the future of work and, and what type of policies and regulations were needed, there's a stronger call for that, uh, that collaboration. So last August, um, the ILO had formed the Global Commission uh, on the Future of Work. And this Global Commission uh, consists of 28 members uh, many of them are from the G20 countries, 
Uh, it's a very diverse uh, leadership uh, coming from the top levels of government, uh, the private sector, workers, uh, organizations, as well as civil society, research, and academia. Uh, the Global Commission is being uh, co-chaired by the President of Mauritius and the Prime Minister of Sweden. And this commission is uh, mandated uh, with looking at the issue of future work, uh, from technology to demographics, climate change, and really thinking about what type of actionable policies we need to make sure that the future work is inclusive for all, um, that the future work is one in which we uh, maintain the principles of the sustainable development goals, which is that we leave no one behind, uh, and of course, uh, the mandate of social justice. Uh, well, these deliberations of the Global Commission are ongoing, and they're not public yet, uh, but we do have a sense of some of the key issues that are going to be addressed. And uh, I want to take this opportunity to talk about a, a couple of them. Uh, I think today we've spent a lot of time talking about, uh, you know, jobs, the future of jobs, uh, what type of jobs will be there, uh, the number of jobs. Um, but there's an aspect that we also want to spend some time talking about, which is the governance of the labor market. Uh, when we see um, the rise of the platform economy, uh, we've talked already today about Gojek here in Indonesia, Uber, uh, the rise of these on-demand jobs uh, that are creating new opportunities that never existed before in transportation, logistics, hotel, and tourism. Uh, there's also the rise of the online gig economy, uh, where workers in one, uh, one country are filling jobs oftentimes for an employer in another country altogether. Uh, here in the Asia Pacific region, we're seeing a rise of these jobs uh, in the areas of uh, software development, uh, creative multimedia work. Uh, but the question that still remains is, what is the relationship between uh, the worker and these uh, online platforms? Uh, is it simply a relationship where they're using the online platform as a, a technical tool and they are simply an independent contractor? Or is there a formal employee-employer relationship? Uh, how, do we, um, how do we rethink about the legality between the relationship between the employer and the employee when they're sitting in different countries? And how do we ensure the protection of rights and work as well as making sure that established social protection systems are not compromised by this new relationship. Now, the other issue I wanted to raise today um, was the idea of the importance of global partnership, uh, international cooperation, so that we can leverage technology to improve the quality of jobs and improve working conditions. Um, and by doing so, let me give a very concrete example, uh, a very specific sectoral example here in the Asia Pacific region. If you look at the uh, garment and footwear industry here in this region, uh, this is a sector that has been uh, very much a part of the story of structural transformation uh, in Asia Pacific. It's uh, been part of the story of poverty reduction and increasing living standards. Uh, for the past few decades, uh, it has created a special pathway for workers who oftentimes are working informally in the agricultural sector, shifting them out and moving them into uh, formal manufacturing jobs that pay regular wages for the very first time. Uh, this garment sector in the region has grown um, over, the, over, over the past uh, several decades. Uh, it now exports more than 600 billion uh, total on an annual basis. Uh, in terms of the global exports, this now accounts for about 60%. And uh, critically, it creates, again, uh, formal wage employment uh, in uh, an industry that employs about 43 million workers. Most of them, uh, again, are women, women workers. With that said, though, the industry still faces a lot of challenges. Uh, the model here in Asia Pacific is still pretty much one that's dominated by uh, high volume, excessive working hours, uh, low skill, low productivity, and therefore low wages. If you look at the 12 major garment producing exporters here in the region, you'll see that eight out of 12 of them Earn, average earnings for workers is still less than $200 per month. Uh, so we're talking about very low, uh, very low wages overall. Uh, there's also issues of, uh, of a consistent gender pay gap uh, that ranges from 10% to 60% uh, with women earning lower wages depending on the country. Um, a part of the issue that we see with low wages is also this issue of compliance, minimum wage compliance. Uh, so that although that the industry is um, typically better regulated, uh, compliance is oftentimes better than other sectors because of global pressure from consumers, from global retailers. Uh, the not recent ILO study found that um, non-compliance and minimum wages were as high as 40 to 50 percent in some countries. 
So recognizing these, um, these positives, these gains and these achievements of the sector, while re also recognizing some of the, uh, the challenges, um, there's been a very unique global partnership that's been established uh, by the ILO and the International Finance Corporation of the World Bank, uh, involving a multitude of do donors from many of the advanced economies to address some of these issues. Um, the program was established in 2009 uh, called Better Work, uh, and it's a unique program because it works really through a global mechanism of partnership and cooperation, working with governments, uh, working with global brands and retailers, working with factory owners, as well as workers and unions, uh, to address some of these issues, uh, making the industry more competitive by respecting labor rights, by ensuring compliance with labor legislation in the workplace. Here in Indonesia, the program was established in 2009, and currently it works with um, 32 brands of retailers, more than 200 factories, and uh, around 400,000 workers. Um, so from the outset, the program has tried to look at ways of using international cooperation and advances in technology to address some of these issues. And let me give uh, a couple very uh, concrete examples here. One of the main issues that was identified at the very beginning was this asymmetry of information between uh, workers and employers. And uh, what they saw was a significant communication gap with workers oftentimes at a disadvantage in terms of information regarding their rights at work, regarding uh, legislation in terms of minimum wages, uh, benefits at work. Uh, so, you know, right off the bat, what, uh, what the program started to do was employing uh, Facebook actually as an application to build a network of workers within factories uh, for information exchange, uh, having that ability to really uh, network and, and, and give uh, real-time updates about uh, happenings within the workplace. Uh, it also developed a mobile phone app that provided information about uh, rights at work and uh, some of these issues in which they can improve and increase their knowledge in the workplace. Uh, there was also a development of a mobile phone app that's been used now as a grievance reporting system. Uh, and it's a two-way dialogue between workers and factory owners. Uh, so a grievance can be reported and there's a communication mechanism now to address that, that grievance and have that dialogue between, between both sides. Uh, but these are some, some of the beginning uh, measures that have been underway. Uh, there's some other ongoing discussions now, not only in Indonesia, but in some of the other Better Work countries, uh, of looking at the use of mobile phone payments uh, to make wage payments as a way to digitize uh, record keeping of wage payments. Uh, this would, in, uh, in principle, also help to reduce minimum wage non-compliance within the industry. Uh, there are other discussions going on about the use of GPS and satellite tracking technology, blockchain technology to improve the uh, verification process along the entire global supply chain uh, so that uh, the suppliers, the origins of the different components that go into our final products are better known and better understood. Um, so there are other examples I can give, but I'd like to leave, leave it here for now. Uh, but just to reiterate the point that uh, it's really important for this idea of uh, policy coordination and and working together behind uh, you know, jobs and the future of jobs, but also it's important for us to keep in mind the importance of, uh, of governance with the labor market, the changing, shifting employment dynamics between workers and employers, and then the idea of how we can leverage technology to actually improve working conditions, making jobs more productive, improving the quality of jobs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fu. So um, I think we've had a very interesting series of presentations. Uh, a real challenge in this session, to my mind, is that um, it's, one can spend a lot of time talking about the policy ideas and recommendations at the individual country level, but the question of international policy cooperation is, uh, is one that I would like to perhaps try to draw some more uh, focus on as we as we go into the second part of our session here. So maybe just to kick the get the ball rolling, let me uh, uh, turn to Alejandro, and I think it's only appropriate that I say get the ball rolling when I was speaking to you, uh, being from Argentina and the ball and football and all that. It's a bad joke. But Alejandro, um, maybe two things to ask you to remark on. Uh, one is um, if you could maybe speak a little bit to what uh, some of the priorities on the future of work uh, agenda. Uh, insofar as it applies to, say, competition policy um, and the international cooperation aspects of that. And then maybe if you can try to weave in also, I think that uh, Palmahindra put down a real challenge for us to think about uh, the both sides of uh, 
uh, one thing is to, is to find mechanisms to ensure that workers are able to transition with the effects of technology. But from the international cooperation and future work perspective, uh, if you have views about what we might do from an international perspective to support the promotion of technology and technology transfer, which I think would be very important also for emerging markets as well. Sure. Yeah, I think that's, uh, yeah, those are two excellent points and two excellent questions. And I, I do take up the recommendation uh, that was put forward. So I guess, first of all, uh, I think I should probably stress a lot more that the G20 being a leader, a leaders forum, um, I can assure you that President Macri is not the only leader that uh, has inclusiveness very much in his heart as one of the key concerns uh, for uh, the G20 as a whole and for the future of work agenda as, uh, as well. And also that we are working on crafting not a risk mitigation agenda, but actually an opportunity agenda. What can we be doing to enable uh, this transition to really capture the opportunities? And yes, to mitigate the risks and challenges as well. But um, I guess I'd like to start by a kind of a less self-serving kind of example of how can this can be dealt with at the international level. So I'm not going to speak about an initiative from my presidency uh, first, although I will in a second. Uh, but actually, for instance, one initiative uh, uh, that I think exemplifies this is um, the eSkills for Girls initiative that was launched under the German presidency, which tries to uh, address the digital divide uh, across genders and uh, to enable the access of women to opportunities in labor markets and to education and skills for the digital era and uh, even training, coding, etc. And uh, which is a an initiative that the G20 launched with UNESCO and with a, a number of other international partners, uh, very much in order to collaborate with especially middle-income and low-income countries. Uh, there are other examples, for instance, there was a workforce launched specifically um, to deal with the transition to the uh, digital economy, which is called the uh, Task Force for the Digital Economy on the Sherpa track of the G20 which we are coordinating very closely with on the finance track as well. And um, for instance, one of the key priorities uh, for, for this year is going to be e-government, actually, among others, uh, which have to do more with industrial policy. So how can we leverage the opportunities of technology to bring services to um, to citizens in a, in a better way to really improve access, make it more efficient, more effective. Um, and I guess one more example that I, that I feel is, is more on the opportunity side that is already ongoing, which we plan to, to further this year, is the Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion, where um, we are working with, uh, like in the multilateral uh, space, uh, not, not just the G20, but also like at the G20, to develop and further policies uh, to leverage fintech, for instance, but also other technologies to really bring financial services um, to, to people who do not have access to them, uh, especially in underserved, like underdeveloped uh, regions within countries or lower income uh, countries or other parts of the world. So, again, I think there is a super exciting, much more ambitious and kind of, uh, there's definitely the opportunity to think about, um, uh, about things we can already be doing. I'm sure that in the future there will be even more things that we can enable by working together. For instance, um, in t there are whole hosts of new industries that will appear that will probably benefit from having some sort of internationally coherent uh, regulatory framework. So for instance, I'm sure that 
if at some point we do decide to get into uh, competition policy and data policy, I'm sure that Facebook would much rather deal with a coherent international framework where at least some high-level principles have been agreed or converged upon over time through international dialogue than having to deal with 200 separate um, regulatory frameworks that are completely different and that put obstacles to data flow, access to information, uh, access to citizens, um, pricing, etc. So, in a way, um, I don't want to give this image that regulation is about stopping things, putting, like, I don't know, uh, obstacles on the way of, uh, in, like, finance companies uh, doing the amazing, incredible things that they are currently doing. I, I really think uh, tech companies uh, are almost enabling what would probably look like superpowers to someone who, who looked at the things we are able to do in the modern age uh, from the Middle Ages or antiquity. Uh, we're able to connect instantaneously. We have this whole host of incredible services, access to information at virtually zero cost instantaneously. I mean, um, the opportunities are really amazing. Um, and I think clearly um, the leaders that we're responding to at the G20 level, when they talk about data policy, competition policy, it's not with an eye on um, really trying to create obstacles. It's on the one hand, trying to guarantee a level playing field, for instance, making sure that we have uh, a regulatory framework that is fair to both technological companies and um, also to regular brick and mortar companies so that it doesn't create unfair advantages for, for both and that it enables um, movement and kind of like uh, the ability of um, traditional companies to move uh, into the tech world and to seize the opportunities of digitalization as well. So I hope that I mean, there are a number of uh, initiatives, both on the finance track and the Sherpa track. Some of them do have to, uh, do, have to do with mitigating challenges, but overall and broadly, what we certainly uh, have like, as, as our main target is to create an opportunity agenda for the future of work that really enables us to, to capture uh, what we think are some amazing opportunities. Thank you, Alejandro, and I thought that was a very eloquent uh, exposition of the balances that you are grappling with in setting the agenda for the, the G20 community this year. And um, I'm glad you mentioned data policy as well, because that's a topic I know that's very close to Ruben as well, and we'll have a chance to come back, uh, come back to that. But if I may first turn uh, next uh, to Pa Mahindra, um, uh, I, I think it would be very interesting to ask you for your perspectives on practical solutions to managing the transitions associated with uh, technological progress. And if I could drill down a little bit, um, you know, we heard from Pu today about the garments sector in Southeast Asia and the, you know, the nature of work and how uh, the relatively low level of incomes of people working in this business. There are very large levels of employment in this uh, sector across Southeast Asia. Uh, earlier today from the McKinsey colleague, we heard that uh, garments is a sector that is particularly susceptible to disruption from new manufacturing platforms. So if you could maybe illustrate your thoughts, um, maybe with this particular sector, but others as well, um, as to how there is scope for international cooperation to manage this transition with any practical suggestions, that would be very useful. Uh, thank you, Vikram. Again, uh, uh, while answering that question, I would like to follow on uh, Alejandro's uh, reminder in the beginning that this is not just another international cooperation. This is the G20 summit or the whole series leading to that. And G20 is a forum for leaders. What we need and probably a little bit missing maybe I don't read too much on this, bro. Uh, sorry for that, is the global leadership 
it's not just leaders forum but the real global leadership on tech sector now what do you want to do in addressing not just inequality you can say in addressing the challenges and how to achieve social development goals by 2030 and then make the format accordingly have a special retreat for the leaders meeting the top tech people and then if you can agree on that you can draft pointers or even uh, very concrete targets and invite them while giving them their task and let them present at the summit and then make a mechanism probably with the troika of the uh, next uh, presidency in monitoring these uh, achievements because this is what we need to improve what now I see a development of lack of trust between again governments, read, regulators, policy makers and the tax sectors. This is very serious before it becomes distrust or mistrust. And leaders can do that. That's what happened in 2008 and 2009. It's not just the bottom up process anymore. It's the leader's guidance. And if you look around the table, uh, this is the, the benefit of the, the retiree uh, share pie. Uh, one day you can enjoy it, but now let me have it. Uh, within the table, around the table, not too many champions, especially for reforms on tech. Not too many. More and more leaders are geared toward how to grab more taxes, how to regulate this, how to protect the incumbents, how to uh, do this and how to, yeah, so many things. As Again, <laughs> you, you should uh, read many references on that. But your president, an easily Indonesian president, would qualify to the few and let them take the lead. And then that you transform the whole leaders forum to the global leadership forum. And then of course we have the Troika and everything and work around that. But if it's just business as usual, the senior officials, the Sherpa, the finance channel preparing everything and as if G20 is another international meeting. No, it's not another international meeting. It's the only international meeting that can do this. Otherwise, what's the purpose of G20? Let's just go back to the UN. Let's just go back to WTO. Let's just go back to the uh, 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 C. So please make use of it. And again, this is uh, uh, quite unique uh, in terms of presidency and leadership and track record of that. And then, like what I also experienced in the past, if you have that global uh, leaders endorsement and, and, and agreements, then it would also empower the leaders to make further reform domestically. Because, it, well, don't embarrass me. I'm the presidency of the G20 and this is the result and I'm not doing this. So that's the purpose of having uh, this, this unique format. If you don't use uh, that uh, opportunity, then I'm very worried that, that really the, the, the tension will, will escalate and we lose this while if you look around, who else can support us to achieve the SDGs, not the business as usual industries. Thanks, Bal Mahindra, but if I can uh, come back to uh, solutions for our sisters and brothers who work in the garment sector, for example and they will be potentially faced with disruptive technological change. Any thoughts that you have on, from an international coordination perspective, what uh, we might be able to do? That, that's the, the risk of, of uh, having uh, these disruptors and disruptive technology to be placed uh, in such an important role. You don't call disruption for nothing. That's the risk. But to look at that as preventing everything that is the, 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 the most important quality uh, of that entities to deliver, 
No, that's wrong. And I think, again, we need leadership. Uh, but, of course, there's always risk. The risk on the, the uh, uh, workers' issues, uh, the risk on the disruption issues, the risk on... But, come on. Name one sector where there is no risk. But would they deliver the same? Okay, I didn't do that. <laughs> Uh, that, that, was just to, that was just to make sure we were all awake. I think it's achieved its uh, purpose. It's uh, always difficult to uh, keep the energy level going in the afternoon sessions. Well, I, th I think that was a very uh, fiery intervention, Pamahenga, and that was a very appropriate uh, end, uh, end to that. Uh, maybe, let, me, let me move on then to, um, uh, to, the, uh, to another issue related to um, uh, international cooperation, which is on trade, and maybe I could turn to uh, to Paul to speak to us a little bit about um, what are the opportunities that you see on the international coordination side on trade policy to uh, think harder about how to mitigate some of the effects of technology while keeping up the benefits of trade. How do we, how do we get a system that um, is open to trade? Trade we know is very important for technology transfer, but how do we find a way to balance that with uh, uh, also ensuring uh, uh, decent equity outcomes. Thank you. Um, well, let, let me segue to that question by picking up a couple of points that were just made as well about governance and the role of the G20 and then how that can potentially uh, lead to, to action in the trade area. I mean, I, I would agree that the G20 Leaders Summit is a unique opportunity. However, it is just a catalyst at the end of the day, right? It is not an institution with direct levers in terms of changing you know, regulations or, or trade rules and things like that. So I would agree with what you're saying, but as you said, I think it builds out globally from there. The G20 alone, to be clear, cannot take direct action you know, in, in, in kind of the levers of organizations. It could try, but um, I think it's, it's really a catalyst role. So it, the trade is, is an interesting example because the, the G20 actually doesn't have a lot of direct you know, power over a, a quite sophisticated trading system under the several decades of the WTO. Interestingly, the digital economy is largely left aside in the existing trade rules. I think it's been a decade or so that the WTO has simply said, let's leave digital economy and transactions to the side. So it's, it's not one of the traditional goods. It's obviously not subjected to tariff regimes and the, the huge complexity around, around trade. And I think it really is raising some of these issues. And tension, I think, is the right word that you've raised um, that, that need to be resolved. The, the main one that I would point to is that the role of data at the central uh, kind of node of this and the questions of you know who owns data, who, um, who collects it, how do you trade it, you know, how, how is it transacted? I mean, for the moment, it's, it really is a bit of a free-for-all in the trade space. Um, and there, there, are, there is the potential of, of data becoming a, a soft barrier to, to trade or even a region for protectionism and things in the absence of, of clarity. So I think there is some tension building there, and so I would agree it's a, it's a promising space um, that, that that needs to be addressed. Um, but again, on, on the G20, I, I like your ideas, but I, I still think it's, you're, in some ways, you're almost asking too much of those leaders to make direct change. They need to direct organizations, as well as the one addition I would add to what you said. Thanks. Well, domestically, of course, it's a different situation, but a lot of these, a lot of these issues require international solutions, right? You can, your, your own trade laws domestically are only going to have a certain amount of impact in the WTO context, right? So the, you, there are certain things that will require uh, coordination between a number of countries. Let me pick up on the data theme and maybe turn to Ruben, actually. So this is um, another area where um, uh, it would be very interesting, Ruben, from your perspective, to get your views on um, is there a need, scope, for greater international cooperation to help us uh, deal with the consequences of data for the digital workplace and what it means for workers? Do we need to have 
data standards, who owns data, how should it be, uh, how should data be protected. If you could speak a little bit to that uh, from your perspective, I think it would be very valuable. Sure. Um, there's definitely room for us to cooperate on, the, on that front. Um, and, and the reason why I say this is, is, is um, for various reasons as well. I think there's, um, there's, a, there's a misconception in many emerging markets, and I'll give the example of, of Indonesia again, because this is the, the area that I'm most familiar with, is that currently I think the, the, the government, and it is changing, but you know, when, I, when I first joined the, the technology sector about five years ago, there's, there's a misconception um, from the government of Indonesia on basically how do we actually calculate the economic benefits of many tech companies. So uh, I'll give you an example in, in, the, in the case of, of, of you know, my, uh, my colleagues and, and, and myself as, uh, as well as often being pressured by the government that you know, Facebook need to actually invest more in Indonesia by investing in a data center, right? And it almost seems to, to us that you know, the, the logic behind why we need to actually develop data centers, why we, other tech companies need to develop factories, is because they see that data centers actually employ lots of people, right? When the reality is it doesn't, right? You get six or 10 people at most, and that includes the cleaners as well, right? And I, I think this is the paradigm that, that we are often struggling as well from, from uh, the tech sector, is that how do we actually meet the governments in the middle on how to quant quantify some of our intangible investments in, in country? So I think one of the speakers earlier in the panel, in the, in the previous panels, were actually talking about, you know, can we actually quantify things such as transfer of knowledge? Can we actually quantify some of the investment that we work with in kind of, you know, investing in digital liter literacy as well? I know, I, I mean, I can speak on behalf of uh, other uh, tech companies as well that are operating in the region. We go a great deal in investing on, you know, how to increase, uh, to, to invest in digital literacy. Um, you know, we would love to actually work with the governments as well, to actually have a better sense on like, how do we actually quantify this as actually part of the investment? Because that's actually some of the challenges that we're facing as well. So I, I'll leave it at that, thank you. Okay, thank you, Ruben. Um, maybe um, let me uh, move on to um, uh, 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 back to this question of trade, actually, and ask uh, Fu if you might have uh, uh, perspectives from your experience in Southeast Asia about uh, whether there is a scope to use uh, uh, trade policy coordination to get uh, to uh, safeguard equity outcomes as well. Um, yes, thank you. Um, when we talk about uh, the, the issue of trade, it's, it's definitely relevant, but I want to expand it a little bit broader uh, to think about not only the trade of goods uh, and capital, the movement of, uh, of goods and capital, but also the flow of workers across borders as well, too. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier this morning in one of the earlier sessions about migration. Uh, that's also something that we expect to be uh, on the rise. Uh, going forward because of demographic trends, uh, because of technology shifting the dynamics in the labor market, uh, shifting the demand for certain skills, and uh, shifting demand for workers in new sectors altogether. Uh, if you think about labor migration, um, you know, the, the, the technical skills, the, the high-tech skills, you know, those will definitely be there, but we also expect with the demographic changes taking place that there is a, um, uh, there's a lot of potential for growth in uh, health and human services, the care economy, uh, a lot of jobs that, uh, that at least today, as it stands right now, have not really um, been able to be taken up by robotics and uh, artificial intelligence, et cetera. Uh, so what do we need to really think about when we are addressing this issue in terms of coordination? Uh, with the rise of migration, et cetera, um, it's, it's important for us to keep in mind uh, the protection of, of these workers in these, uh, in these different types of uh, Migration flows. Uh, it's also important for us to think about social protection schemes, uh, the extent in which the uh, the policies are in place for mobility of uh, of social protection systems. Whether they can bring those social protection uh, uh, accounts back with them to their home countries um, upon repatriation. So there's different issues there in terms of policy that need to be thought through. Uh, but uh, 
thinking about social protection and, and migration is something that needs to be considered as well when we think about the impact of technology on the labor market and in terms of uh, workers and workers' rights. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Fu. That was, uh, that was, uh, that was very helpful. Um, maybe uh, I could turn uh, back to uh, Parmahendra on the topic of international taxation and cooperation, and cooperation here. Um, I think if you could share some of your perspectives, having worked with the G20 for some time, uh, global cooperation and taxation issues has been a very big issue for the G20 on the base erosion and profit shifting issues. Is this something that, um, would you say that the new tech issues, is this going to be something that we would have to have different approaches on in order to uh, uh, mitigate the concerns we have in international taxation? Well, of course, when we talk about the PEPS uh, initiative, it was more on uh, improving the transparency and the governance of all, uh, let's say, uh, uh, taxation systems across borders. And I think it's, it's really uh, uh, has a, you know, a merit by itself. Uh, but this is the point. This is the point again and again I would like to reiterate. It is one thing that we agree on something looking at the conventional industry, companies, ecosystems. And it is another thing you then cut and paste or, you know, in a way uh, use the tools to look at the tax sectors. That is not the way, because again, why these guys now here around us is because they want to address problems, issues, and create solutions that the conventional business cannot do. But if the regulators, with the limitation and capacity uh, that they have, they can only think through this conventional way, looking at the tech sector. It won't work. Because, for instance, even among business models, I also come to a conclusion that a tech sector cannot be integrated into a conventional business model or uh, industry. Because, again, the, the values are different. The career plan is different. The incentives plan is different. Basically, the whole ecosystems are different. So, you see, unless you can create a specific and customized arrangements only for this tech, and mind you, do you want to make a guess? How many adjustments and sub-customization for this tech? Now, when, when they were asked, I have uh, this experience myself, when they were asked to submit a business plan to get license uh, to the regulator, they were speechless. They said, how could I give you a business plan? I don't even know what would I become in one year from now. Should I, you know, artificially engineer that? But that shows not their lack or lack of creativity and imagination because of the competitiveness, because of the situation that is different from there. And when they were asked, well, judging from your ownerships, then you are now practically foreign-owned company. Because 70% or 80% of these shares uh, are owned by foreign investors. Again, the old mindset, looking through the old system and judge and make decision on the new tech situation. For the investors in the old system, acquiring majority is the way to also acquire the decision-making process. But if they invest in the tech sector, one thing they want to ask in the beginning 
is to ensure that the founders, the CEO, the CTO will not go anywhere. And they will be given the authority to make decisions, regardless who own the shares. So again, there are so many examples that we can talk about. But the issue is that once, if you look through this, then you fail to recognize what's going on there. The second point, you cannot judge how to manage this directly. Why? You don't have the knowledge. How do you have the knowledge? Because they don't know what happened next year. So it goes back to the situation again. Unless we understand the complexity of this matter, at least that will be a good start. If not, I don't think you contribute any added value. Paul, uh, I wonder if you wanted to react to that. Maybe if you could uh, add a few remarks about the role you see for tax policy in dealing with uh, mitigating some of the effects of technology. Sure. Um, I think um, there, it's important to note there's a major report of the OECD coming out this spring on digital taxation, which I think is, is going to get at a lot of these issues, which are still very much under discussion, right? This is, uh, for tax policy uh, experts out there, this, you know, they're, they're, they're in an early conversation with, with quite strong views, I think, uh, across the spectrum. But one thing that seems to be clear is that, as was said a minute ago, there's no cut and paste you know, kind of solutions. I think the, the kind of existential question, if I can put it that way, for tax, um, thinking about the future, is they, they want to be able to capture enough of the productive economic activities to maintain viable tax systems, right? I mean, it's as, it's as fundamental as that. If there are so many things that are intangibles and, and not captured as the system, there's a, there's a real concern about the integrity of the tax system, obviously, to, to maintain. So there, there is a deep question. I, I don't think um, there's a rush to, to a solution there, but there, there is a challenge uh, because things are moving very quickly and companies need, uh, need direction here. You know, the, um, the, the joke that comes to my mind on this, um, I would have to say is, uh, you know, I think, I think it's gonna be a bit of a s somewhat slow progress because it is a very difficult issue, but there's the kind of joke question of will artificial intelligence robots agree to be taxed, you know, ultimately. Um, <laughs> I, I'm joking, but there will be this, this, you know, where does it end question of, uh, you know, are, how many layers down do you, do you tax uh, in the system? It's, it's very, very complex. I shudder to live in a world where we will be taxed by the robots. Who knows where things would go. But maybe it's a good time to turn to some of the questions that uh, we have received uh, from the audience. And um, maybe what I'll do is ask, uh, picking up on the first question, uh, let me interpret it as asking each of you to share with the audience your number one international cooperation priority. So maybe we start with um, Parmahendra and work our way across. Your number one priority, if you had to come up with one priority for international cooperation to manage the future of work, we've talked about many different policy issues, taxation, trade, um, competition policy, data policy, a, the, the range is quite wide, but uh, what would be your number one? Bring in the tax sector into the mainstream addressing the global problems. That is what and the top priority. And what is the global problem? For emerging economies, developing countries, very clear. Sustainable development goals. Do it. The rest, you can have other channels. But no one is doing this. I, I like that comment and I would agree with it. I would add that focus that conversation on data and those issues that I mentioned earlier. Ownership, tradability, you know, accountability, etc., privacy, and those things, and then I think you've got the, the conversation. I guess at the, first of all, I agree with those comments. I think at, a, at the highest level, inclusiveness is sort of what underlies everything else. If you fail at, at inclusiveness, then everything else is put 
on the back burner. You can't address climate change, you can't address trade, you can't address uh, anything. Like the moment that um, inclusiveness fails, it's kind of like everyone for themselves and everything gets pushed back. So I think, I think it's really important to, like, to keep that as a kind of inclusive growth as, a, as a, at the heart of, uh, of the objective. And in terms of that, I think probably um, key policies have to do with uh, investing in human capital and uh, early childhood kind of uh, interventions and making sure that every child has an, uh, an equal opportunity both in terms of health, nutrition and access to education and skills and also to have um, like for, for adults, for the, for the existing population to have flexible um, safety nets that are actually following the person rather than their, their current po position and that are adapted to their new realities of technology. I think uh, if we can focus on one area of international cooperation, uh, I'd like to go back to this point about data, but slightly from a different perspective, uh, in that um, I think there's a lot of potential now for big data, big data analytics. Uh, you think about a lot of these online uh, job posting sites, if you think about um, a lot of these professional network sites, there's a lot of wealth of information there that can really inform us in terms of labor market dynamics uh, beyond the traditional uh, information from official statistics. Um, I think there's a lot of potential there uh, in terms of the data analytics, uh, the technology is there, but what's lacking is that cooperation, the mechanisms for partnership between the private sector, uh, multilateral organizations from national statistical offices, and I think that's an area which we could really um, do so much more in terms of informing our labor markets, informing our labor market policies, education training uh, providers, uh, how we prepare for the future. So uh, I share with, with everyone here earlier, um, you know, Facebook's overall mission is actually to, to, to build communities and to connect the world together. I think, I think, I think one key area specifically for, uh, for us that, that we would be super interested in is that how do we actually make better use of data like everyone else here. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you a clear example. Uh, currently, well, I think about an hour ago, uh, not far away from Jakarta, there was recently an earthquake. Uh, you know, in places such as, uh, in, in incidents such as this, what we do is that we actually um, take some of the, the, the actual posts of our users and we actually work with local governments as well as to actually push some of that data to actually how do we actually distribute some of the necessary resources in one of these prone areas. I, I, I mean, that disaster relief is just only one sliver of some of the work that we can do. You know, I, I think overall we'd be super interested is that how do we actually push out you know, use some of the data that we have, partner with governments, and at the very least, focus on basic services such as education, healthcare, and, and the other basic services as well. Uh, that's, that's one big portion, and I think the other big portion as well is actually to push digital literacy as well to, you know, some of the most challenging parts as well. Because, you know, as I mentioned at the end of the day, um, you know, technology can only go so far. I mean, if we can actually, you know, make sure that the users of our technology uh, can optimize it to its full benefit, then this is not really much use for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe one more question. So maybe just to wrap up what I think has been a, a super interesting uh, conversation, let me interpret one of, the, one of the other questions. There's a question about uh, policies to bridge divides. And maybe Alejandro, I could ask you, and if others want to jump in after, if you could maybe speak a little bit to what you see as challenges for emerging markets. We're in Indonesia, one of the biggest emerging markets. If you were to speak to the emerging market audience in terms of what you see as some of the key challenges for uh, adapting to the technological change in a way, you know, reaping the benefits that uh, Paul Mahindra has reminded us of, but dealing with the challenges as well, what would they be from the EM perspective? So obviously, um, Argentina is an emerging market, so this is a question that goes very much to the heart of why we care about this topic and we, why we think this is a, an important topic for emerging markets as well. I would say on the one hand, uh, we have probably, probably not seen quite the same trends 
uh, across emerging markets, as we have seen in uh, developed economies, there is more var a wider variety of, uh, of impacts, and also some areas where we don't see the same impacts that we see already in uh, advanced economies. One of the things that uh, is particularly important is that emerging markets tend to have a lower capacity to deal with shocks and to deal with, um, uh, let's say, with fast changes when they happen. We have more vulnerable populations with uh, l lower, let's say, cushions uh, and smaller cushions and uh, a lower ability to, to really respond to losing a job or to uh, losing an opportunity. So we can't wait until risks materialize. We have to be proactive about actually um, building our readiness and, our, uh, and uh, kind of building resilience, as, uh, as the previous President Cipriani would put it, and building our social safety nets uh, on a much tighter, let's say, budget. Um, I also think some of the challenges have to do with the fact that if, uh, if lower salaries erode as a competitive advantage, then that means that it will be harder for us to use that as the lever to industrialize and develop and integrate ourselves into the global economy. So we will need to find other advantages and other ways to do that. Um, and, uh, and also, if at the same time we're facing um, barriers to trade that are being imposed because of political constraints elsewhere. That is a kind of double challenge to emerging markets in, STEM of, in terms of responding to this. Uh, so I guess we have um, more difficulty, or let's say we, we have a longer way to go in terms of providing high quality education with the skills for the 21st century at scale uh, in every corner uh, with uh, like reaching people uh, and establishing the connectivity and the infrastructure that we'll need to establish that equality opportunity um, and finding the ways to, uh, to really kind of deliver that opportunity and uh, I think those are specific challenges to emerging markets. At the same time, I would say that there are a few opportunities that are specific to emerging markets. We have um, the ability to leapfrog obsolete technologies. We have um, capital prices, uh, production prices that are falling very quickly, which means that we can adopt new technologies and uh, kind of access capital markets, uh, sorry, capital goods of the latest technology, which if it's true that they're going to be as technologically advanced and productive, as, uh, as it looks like they're going to be, then that would mean that you could very quickly have uh, a productive, um, let's say, a productive uh, capital base that is state-of-the-art for much cheaper than it cost the current advanced economies to, uh, to, to get to that point. Uh, we currently have access to what are still uh, low uh, interest rates to finance those, those types of investments. We tend to be wealthier in terms of natural resources. So I think at the end of the day, um, we have very specific challenges. We also have some, uh, some very interesting opportunities and it's a matter of uh, trying to be proactive and strategic about seizing uh, those opportunities. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I think uh, that pretty much wraps us up for this session. Please, uh, if I could ask the audience to join me in giving a hand of applause to our panelists, who has been an excellent discussion. Thank you all very much. Thank you to the moderator and all speakers. You may all go back to your seat. Ladies and gentlemen, it was the conclusion of the last session of the seminar. As we have come to the end of the seminar, we are honored to have closing remark delivered by Director of Center for Climate Finance and Multilateral Policy, Ministry of Finance of the Republic of Indonesia. I am now very pleased to invite Mr. Pargiono to deliver his closing remarks.
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, finally, we have come to the end of the session and all of the program for today uh, seminar. Distinguished participants, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, throughout the day we have discussed various issues regarding the adoption of technology, its impact on inequality, and its role in changing the future of birds. The potential of technology to be an enabler of productivity growth and efficiency improvement has been noted as well as its potential impact on inequality and employment. Concerns have also been raised about how technology can shape the future of our labor market and how policies can help transform technology into a tool of equality. Many of our speakers have conveyed their optimism on the role of technology to improve the well-being of people as a whole. In case of Indonesia, we have seen from the keynote presentation from our Minister of Planning this morning, the growing trend of internet uses and also access, which poses both opportunities and challenges to our economy. Opp opportunity is created by, among others, the improvement of market access for SMEs, usually operating within their traditional borders. Challenges exist due to, among others, the shift of consumers from bricks and mortar business to online business. From today, first session, we can underline the key factors that can determine the successful implementation of technology in an emerging market with a huge demographic dividend such as Indonesia. The first is the human resource capacity. For a successful implementation of technology, human resource capacity should be improved. And not just capacity in terms of technology know-how, but also the capacity of workers themselves in learning. The second is the capacity for business institution to adapt by using an effective technology business model, which effectively incorporates small holders business, raising the opportunity to open more jobs at a relatively low skill level. The third is extensive uh, ex the existence of a conducive business environment, policies, and infrastructure. These are the preconditions required for the growth of any business. To realize this, I would like to refer to our former Minister of Finance, Dr. Hadi Basri's statements that the most important thing that policymakers should do is to work and create policies based on a working principle. For me personally, that governing principle should treat technology as a tool for achieving development goals, not only in terms of growth in GDP per capita and employment, but also in terms of the value-added process and the value added of product and services. All of this requires the delicate balancing of policy support between the high tech and high capital intensive, including industry intensive deployment, well preserving, well in preserving, and nurturing a more traditional and human capital intensive industry, such as our traditional art and our cultural products. As such, Indonesia, as a member of G20, has made progress in implementing policies in support of the adoption of technology that favor inclusiveness, such as development of product and service considerators, such as we have Gojek, Bukalapa, etc. For Indonesia, it's also urgent to address the technological gap through community facilitator, getting the poor to have a use access to fintech by using, for example, e money. And also social protection, like just the training program, land ownership issues, land certification, rice subsidy, subsidy programs. A new technology is adopted. Some job may last temporarily, but as labor adjusts and demand for a new technology increases, new job opportunities open and labor that was passed out can re-enter the market with a more specialized skill seeking new opportunities. Let, uh, last but not least, a guide bureaucracy with the, with the flexible regulation or dynamic supervision principle best so can adapt to the new and quick things of technology advancement. 
The government of Indonesia right now is trying to formulate new policies to create a level playing field both for high technology industries and conventional industries. With this policy, the government does not want new technology to disrupt conventional industry, while a number of jobs will be created in new high technology industry. A number of jobs are going to be taken away. The government has to formulate policies on how to put taxation on technology transaction that ensure it that ensure conventional economy and new technological industry can grow together. In closing, I realize that the issue of technology and its impact on inequality and job in the future is too complicated to be resolved through just a series of today seminar. Therefore, a further discussion among international experts, policymakers, and market players is needed to hopefully arrive at a conclusion on how we can collectively and effectively respond to the source of technology adoption. As a representative of the House, I value and greatly appreciate all of the insight, suggestions and views that already be shared through all the day uh, seminar. Therefore, as a token, uh, our appreciation, we would like to invite all of you to a cultural dinner this evening and for our G20 guests and delegates, I wish all of you successful meeting over the next two days. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you.